Okay, so we have learned that when a system is at equilibrium, the rate of the forward and the rate of the reverse reaction are going to be equal. So now what we're going to say is that a change can sometimes be imposed upon a system that's at equilibrium, and the position of that equilibrium will shift in the direction that tends to reduce that change. Let's find our... Um, so, basically, if a stress is applied, and the three types of stresses that could be applied would either be a change in concentration, a change in temperature, or a change in pressure. And when a, a stress is applied to that system, that system is going to do everything it can do to get back to equilibrium. So, it's going to respond by relieving that stress. So, our first example that we're going to look at is a change in concentration. So if you add a certain amount of some sort of chemical, that system is going to respond by trying to get rid of that chemical. So again, it's trying to relieve that stress that is added. So we have right here, we have our reaction that's written down. And then just a reminder of how you go about calculating K or KEQ, in other words, your equilibrium constant, remembering that it's the concentration of your products raised to the power of their coefficients divided by the concentration of the reactants raised to the power of their coefficients. Um, something that you might think about, and I'm going to stress this when we uh, get to temperature, but KEQ, your equilibrium constant, does not change with changing concentration. Okay, so our first example, if we have our reaction right here, A plus B yields C plus D, we want to think about which direction the reaction is going to shift to be able to get back to equilibrium. So we're assuming that it started at equilibrium and then we added some B. So if you add B, what's going to happen is since you ha now have excess B, the system wants to get rid of the B, so it's going to go ahead and shift in the direction of the products to try and remove that chemical. So it's going to try and get rid of B by creating more products. Another way that I like to think about this is let's go ahead and imagine a big water trough. And we'll have our imaginary line right here where our arrow is. And we know that this is A plus B on this side of that. And then we have C plus D on this side. So if we were to add more, um, add more B, that's a reactant. It's on the left-hand side of the equation. So let's just pretend for a minute that we're adding more B by creating a big mountain of B. So we add this water and create this big mountain of water. Well, you can't do that. Water would not behave that way. We know that it would shift to the right to try and um, level out. So in order to reach equilibrium, it's going to want to shift to the right. It's going to. And another way of phrasing that, remember, we could say, in in this case, we'll say shift right. But another way would be to say the forward reaction is more probable. Or another way of saying that is it's going to create more products. So all three of those things are saying the exact same thing. The forward reaction is more likely to take place, it creates more products, or it shifts to the right. Okay, let's do our next one. I'm going to erase this part. In the next one, we have, um, we're adding D. So again, we have our big trough of water. And in this case, we're adding a big mountain of water on this side. So we would see that it's going to shift to the left. And then finally, if we were to remove some of C, now we get out the big shovel. And let me erase this. We get out our shovel, and we dig a big, deep hole into our water trough. So again, we know that that's not going to really occur. Instead, what's going to happen is water is going to go back to fill it in. So if we were to remove some of C, remember the system is going to try and get back to equilibrium, so we want it wants to replace that C. So it's going to shift to the right in this case. which is the same as saying creating more products or a forward reaction. Um, now let's go ahead and relate this to a situation where we actually have some reactants and products in an equation, not just A's and B's and C's. So in this case, it says predict what will happen if the following chemicals are added to the following reaction that is at equilibrium. 
So in all cases, we're adding these chemicals. First thing is adding sodium acetate. I look at my reaction, I don't see sodium acetate there anywhere at all. So I have to then think a little bit further. Sodium acetate, I know from my solubility rules that sodium acetate is very soluble. All my alkali metals are soluble and acetates are soluble. So that means that really by adding sodium acetate, I'm adding sodium ions and I'm adding acetate ions. Sodium ions don't mean a lot to me because if I look there, I don't see sodium ions anywhere in the equation at all, the reaction. So that doesn't do anything to affect my equilibrium. However, by adding acetate ions, I can see right here on the right-hand side of my equation that adding acetate ions is going to cause my equilibrium to shift to the left. So it will shift in this direction by adding that big mountain of acetate ions here. So the thing you really had to think about here is that you had to break down that compound, that soluble compound, into the different ions to be able to think this one through. The next one says sodium chloride. With sodium chloride, you, once again, we don't see sodium chloride in the reaction. So it's the same thing as adding sodium ions and chloride ions. I don't see either of those, definitely not sodium, and I don't see chloride anywhere either. So what this is going to give us is no change. It will not affect my equilibrium position. And then the last one is adding hydrochloric acid. So by adding hydrochloric acid, again, the first um, step strategy that you would take is to double check and see if there's any hydrochloric acid anywhere in the reaction. No, there's not. But we know that all acids are aqueous. This one's also, it will ionize, it will break down into its ions of hydrogen and chloride. So what that means is that I've got some hydrogen ions there. So again, this is going to shift to the left. Okay. So that really is it for our examples of increasing or decreasing concentrations, adding um, or removing um, reactants or products. The next type of stress that might be applied would be a temperature change. And this is something that is pretty important. You saw this on your notes on equilibrium, trying to calculate equilibrium constants and the equilibrium constant expression. It gave you an example where it said, hey, the temperature is 250 degrees. And then it gave you all these concentrations. But you never used that 250 degrees in any of your calculations. Instead, that was just given to you because your equilibrium constant would be very different if it was at a different temperature. So it's just some additional information for you. So what you should know is that your equilibrium constant does change with changing temperature. So that is pretty important to know. Um, now I'm going to jump down here to some other things where we've got information about endo and exothermic reactions, and you've got this blurb on your paper as well. Remember that endothermic reactions, that's when you have heat that enters a reaction, whereas exothermic is when you have heat energy that exits a reaction. And you just need to memorize. We've looked at this already, so hopefully you remember that endothermic reactions have positive kil kilojoule values and exothermic have negative, so you just have to have that memorized. The important thing to know here, though, is if in an endothermic reaction you have it entering, that means that you will see your reaction, your heat, I'm sorry, your heat on up, that's going to get covered up, on the left-hand side of the equation. So what we see here is heat energy on the left-hand side, so that's going to be an endothermic reaction, whereas this first one is an exothermic because we see heat on the right-hand side of the equation. It's actually exiting. So that's what you should be able to tell, and that's what you're going to want to do is label your kilojoules either on the right or left-hand side of the equation. That's going to help you with Le Chatelier's. So these are the notes that you have in front of you. Um, going back to what happens, remember in Le Chatelier's, if something is at uh, equilibrium and the stress is applied, it's going to do everything it can do to get back to equilibrium. So if you change the temperature, if you do something like try and heat it up, 
it's going to, so we can see here, if you heat up a reaction, it's going to try and cool itself back down, and then vice versa. If you were to cool it down, it's going to try and heat itself back up. So in order to work through this, you have to know whether the reaction is endo or exothermic, and then this is what we just mentioned. So your um, values of positive or negative, you'll see those as delta H, your change in heat energies. So you can read through that again. So now in this example, I see I have a reaction, and then over to the right it says delta H equals negative. So that's the thing that should catch my eye right there. So I know that negative delta H values are exothermic, and I know that exothermic reactions, that means my heat is exiting. In other words, it's on the right-hand side. I know that this says negative, but I still put a plus here. That's a common question that I get. So the you still are adding the kilojoules. That sign of a negative just tells you which side of your arrow you're adding that to. So your kilojoules are on the right-hand side of the equation. So now the question is, what would happen if the reaction is at equilibrium and the flask, the flask containing the reaction is heated up? So it's important for us to know that this is an exothermic reaction because now by heating it up, what we're doing is we're adding kilojoules. That's what that says. If you're heating it up, you're adding kilojoules. If you're cooling it down, then you would be removing kilojoules. So since we're adding kilojoules, you just need to look at your equation and see which side you're adding to. So again, you could really look at this as being your water example. And we're adding kilojoules to the right-hand side, so we know that it's going to shift to the left. In other words, you're going to create more reactants. In other words, the reverse reaction is favored. So those all say the same thing. Okay, now for my favorite question on this this lesson here. Calcium hydroxide is less soluble in boiling water than in cold water. That tells us a lot of information right there. And the question is, is the dissolving of calcium hydroxide exothermic or endothermic? Well, when we look at this reaction, it's a reversible reaction, remember, we see that we have our ions, our aqueous ions, on the right-hand side of our equation. <coughs> Excuse me. So we've got those uh, ions on the right-hand side, meaning that as you create the products, as you move in this direction, that what's happening is it is dissolving. You have a solid that is turning into ions. So that's, that's the dissolving process. So first sentence says calcium hydroxide is less soluble in boiling water. So in cold water, it's more soluble, meaning that it will move to the right, it will become soluble, it will break into ions when it's cold, when you remove kilojoules. So that's what you should really get out of this, is that you should see that the forward reaction occurs when it becomes colder. So in other words, when you remove kilojoules. And you might have to stop and think about that for a little bit, but that's the big important part to get out of this, that the forward reaction will occur when you remove kilojoules, and that first sentence tells us that. So what that means is when you remove the kilojoules, it's going to progress in the forward reaction. So where must those kilojoules be? If they were on the left-hand side, and you remove them, it would actually fill in, it would, re it would reverse and be the reverse re reaction. So the answer is that the kilojoules are on the right-hand side because when you remove these, the reaction shifts in this direction to, um, to reach equilibrium again. So because our kilojoules are on the right-hand side, that makes it an exothermic reaction. Okay. Then we get to pressure, and with pressure, um, I know that you guys know this, 
only affects gases. Remember, those molecules are really far apart, so they can easily be compressed, and liquids and solids cannot be compressed as easily. So um, gases are going to be the ones that are affected. What you need to do is you need to look and figure out where the most moles of gas are in your equation. So here's just a little reminder about your equilibrium constant. And then also a little reminder that sometimes you're not given information directly about the pressure. Instead, you're given information about your volume. So if you were to take a gas, same, vol uh, same mo number of moles of gas, and you were to put it into a smaller container, in other words, you decreased your volume, well, that gas is now going to be at a greater pressure because we know from Boyle's law that there's an inverse relationship between pressure and volume. So that's our reminder there. So in this example, it says the reaction below is at equilibrium if its volume is reduced. So again, this is really what we just wrote down, but if volume's reduced, pressure would be increased. So the question is, what happens to the reaction? The way you want to approach this is you look at this reaction and you say on the left-hand side, there's a gas and we have a total of four moles of gas on the left-hand side of our equation. On the right-hand side of our equation, we have a total of nine moles of gas. So this is one big container. It's not like we're changing the pressure and, and adding more pressure on one side than the other to the reactants or the products. Both of them are under the same amount of pressure because they're all in one container. But the right side of your equation has more gas in it because there's more moles of gas on the right hand side therefore it feels the effect of the pressure change more so in this case it says if if your pressure and this is what i care about i don't really care about the fact that the volume is reduced it's the fact that the pressure is increased and if you think about what that means on a molecular level if you're increasing those the pressure those molecules are now a lot closer together and um, therefore the concentration is going to be increased. So you could essentially say that you're increasing the concentration of your product. So if you increase the concentration of your products, now I've got more here, then what's going to happen is it is going to shift to the left. Okay, if for some reason you did have the same number of moles of gas on each side, then they would both be affected the same, so there would be no change. Okay, now we have looked at our three stresses, concentration, temperature, and pressure. Now what we want to do is we want to come up with a mathematical approach on how we can go about figuring out which direction it is going to shift, a system's going to shift to get back to equilibrium. If you know some original um, concentrations when it's not at equilibrium. So the way we're going to go about this is, again, we're going to look at that ratio of products to reactants. Remember, that's the concentration of your products raised to the power of their coefficients over the concentration of the reactants raised to the power of their coefficients. We're going to compare this to what we know the equilibrium constant to be, and then we'll just have to check and see out of these three what, what we need to do in order to have it um, get to equilibrium again. So last example we have here, we have three compounds and we're given the concentrations of all these compounds and we are also told that the equilibrium constant is, I'm just going to rewrite this, our equilibrium constant is 0.041, so that's given to us. But now these three compounds with these three concentrations that are given are not at equilibrium. So I'm just going to write myself a note here. Not at equilibrium. Therefore, we must calculate kind of a fake K value, a fake equilibrium constant. We're going to call that Q. So that just happens to be where it's at at the moment, given those concentrations. So we're going to go through the same process that we've done, we did last lesson and um, earlier today. So we're going to say that our Q, I'm going to write the expression first, remember it's products over reactants. So that's going to be the concentration of PCl3 raised to the first power times the concentration of Cl2 raised to the first power divided by the concentration of PCl5 raised to the first power. 
and I have those original values, or initial values, concentrations, so I can go ahead and plug those in, and I see that it's 0 0.08 molar times 0 0.04 divided by 0 0.06. And I do a little math, and I get 0 0.053. Once again, there's no units on that. That's just a constant. Now, when I compare this, this is what we have as a value for our Q, our, our, um, co our constant that is not at equilibrium, whereas this is the value that it will be when it reaches equilibrium. So remembering that the way we go about that is the concentration of your products raised to the power of their coefficients divided by the concentration of the reactants raised to the power of their coefficients you can look at this value and say 0.053 is too big. That's bigger than 0.041. So it is too big. We can look back at how you go about figuring out K values and see if it's too big, what does that mean you've got? It looks to me like you've got too much of what's in your numerator. You've got too much of your products. So too much product. So if you've got too much product, too much of this stuff, PCL3 and Cl2, what has to happen for it to reach equilibrium? It has to shift in this direction and create more reactants. So it's going to need to shift to the left. Um, and actually, the way it's phrased here, it would be the reverse reaction would take place more often until equilibrium is reached again. So that is Le Chatelier's.